Good morning and welcome to Wellington's 2018 results conference call. I'm Howard Mullen, Wellington's CFO. You'll all have likely have seen Wellington's NZX release on the 2018 results and hopefully most of you will have looked at the audited financial statements that were released on March 1st. I'll make some comments on the financial performance of the year and Greg will then provide an update on the business as we progress into H1 2019. Greg will also talk a bit about the exciting opportunities for Wellington in the digital space. I'll start with the usual warning. We'll be making some forward-looking statements on this call today, and as these are predictive in nature, they are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties relating to Wellington, its operations, and the market in which it competes. Some things are beyond the control of Wellington, and actual results and conditions may differ materially from those expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. Our team was very pleased with the revenue growth and profit expansion in 2018. Revenue in the fourth quarter was $18 million, compared to 11.8 for the same quarter in 2017, a 53% increase. Fourth quarter revenue was the largest single quarter revenue in the company's history, and December the company's highest ever month. Full year revenue increased by 36% to $58.8 million, consistent with revenue growing at a compound annual growth rate of 35% for the last five years. At our 2018 shareholder meeting, we highlighted that a CAGA of 15% would get us to around $100 million of revenue over the next five years. We feel like we're on track to our growth vision. In volume terms, we continued new product growth, with Wellington Connect SES volume growing 62%, and EC motor volume growing 24%. Within the EC stats, ECR2 grew uh, 75%. ECR2 is our new EC motor. We shipped 1.7 million motors and over 300,000 SES Connect in the financial year. Record volumes for both. Our software services business continued to grow its annuity value with billings for the year increasing to 2.1 million from 1 million in 2017. We're currently holding $3 million of deferred revenue on the balance sheet. Our iProximity marketing software directly contributed to the winning of a major international beer brand, which we expect to ship to revenue at material volumes in 2019. We also commenced several trials for iProximity marketing solutions with global snack food brands and received the first orders for its iProximity solutions integrated with the Wellington Connect IoT platform. Gross margin was a little disappointing at 24.3% compared to 23.9% in 2017. The company came under price pressure in its EC motor business towards the end of 2017 and through 2018 and responded accordingly to remain competitive. Additional one-time costs of $0.5 million were incurred to successfully manage supply constraints in the global electronics components market. Component shortages are easing somewhat but are expected to continue well into 2019. As our business continues to move more towards an IoT future, we expect margin expansion will accelerate. The team is very pleased to deliver its first ever EBIT profit, with EBIT at 0.5 million compared to a loss of 1 million in 2017. Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization and impairment was a profit of 2.5. The result was in line with previously bit to guidance issued by the company in January 2018 of between 2 to 4 million. The EBITDA result includes a $300,000 gain due to the adoption of NZ IFRA 16 accounting requirements for leases. The net loss of the year was 0.7 versus a $2 million loss in 2017. Cash was 0.9 compared to 1.6 at December 2017. This was lower than we expected because we saw unusual extended payment terms from some customers in the third and fourth quarter. While this situation is improving in the early part of 2019, we do see major beverage brands requiring payment terms of 120 days as part of their growth and working capital improvement programs. Net debt, being borrowings excluding lease liabilities less cash, at 31 December 2018 was $3 million versus net debt of $1 million at December 2017. Adoption of the new leasing accounting standard resulted in a $1.7 million increase in borrowings in 2018 for leases previously treated as operating expenses. Debt included a US dollar 600000 loan from Meta Capital, a $2.5 million loan on Investments, and $0.5 million owed to SmartShares. 
With respect to these short-term debt contracts due to mature in 2019, the company expects to be able to meet its repayment obligations. Improving operating cash flows was a highlight and amounted to 1.8 million, up from 1.3 million for the corresponding period in 2017. Net operating and investing cash flows amounted to a 2 million outflow for 12 months, including 1.4 million paid on the acquisition of iProximity. The team achieved a best in class inventory result with 11 inventory turns for the year to 31 December, compared to 10 for the same period last year. It's pleasing to see how the supply chain and customer teams have led this transformation in working capital, recalling that only a few years ago we were turning inventory in low single digits. We are very comfortable with our revenue and profit growth momentum and also quite pleased with the ever-improving working capital and operating cash performance. Certainly we have more work to do, but the ability we have to rapidly turn product into cash and increase the software business contribution puts the company in a good place for future planning and profits. At this point, I'll hand the call over to Greg. Thanks, Howard. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the call. I'm going to focus my comments on our Wellington Connect IoT uh, ecosystem, which underpins our Internet of Things business. The Wellington Connect uh, IoT ecosystem is a system that captures, uploads, and analyzes data from a customer, customer's point-of-sale equipment fleet and then delivers system-generated, actionable insights to help them improve their fleet performance and sell more product. Now, that's not to say we're ignoring motors, but just the bottle cooler motor growth and profits will remain steady and on the occasional year, like in 2019, shrink as that market fully commoditizes and we at Wellington start to move away from the lower end of the refrigeration motor market. So back to IoT, we are already embedded as a major supplier to the food and beverage market in the IoT services space, with last year of around $17 million of our sales coming from solutions in that market. We have over half a million connected devices installed with data services, and by sometime in 2020, that should be closer to 1 million. Those devices connect cooling equipment for the world's largest food and beverage brands. It's a very exciting space, and when we started this journey three or four years ago, we didn't fully appreciate where it could take us. Just a few examples of what's happening in this space. IDC, the International Data Corporation, uh, predicts that spending on the Internet of Things will reach $1.2 trillion by 2022, with a CAGR of around 13.6% up to that period. And Bain Consulting is predicting that the combined markets of Internet of Things will grow to about $520 billion in 2021, so that's more than double what it was in 2017. So we'd like to think we're riding part of that growth curve at least. Now, when we talk about Wellington's IoT offering for food and beverage, in Wellington, we mean four layers of Internet-enabled and digital solutions. The first is our hardware, our wirelessly connected hardware, that ensures our customers' point-of-sales equipment is connected to the Internet. That could be the Wellington Connect SCS, which you heard from Howard, the great sales we achieved last year. It could be a Connect tag, which is an NFC QR code tag, that we use on ambient goods, or it could be a retrofit device called a Connect Monitor that we fit on already installed coolers. The second layer is our operational infrastructure that sits in the cloud, the data platform. Wellington Connect and Wellington Marketing Cloud provide the data platform to ensure our retail brands can access the location of their equipment, see how their equipment is performing, and access sales performance data. The third layer of our solution are the apps and software tools that we develop in-house, such as Wellington Connect Promotions, powered by our iProximity software. Our in-house developed apps, which include a retailer, an OEM dashboard, and insight tool apps. Our IoT software bundle helps retailers sell more product, lowers their distribution costs, and helps, helps them manage their point-of-sale equipment more effectively and efficiently. We're also adapting our digital marketing software to find new ways to help our customers connect with the consumer and deliver buying incentives. 
The fourth layer is comprised of APIs or application programming interface software and software development kits or SDKs that we develop in-house for customer developed apps and to connect with third party enterprise platforms. These ensure seamless operation with an expanding number of customer enterprise systems. Um, we also have new technology that we're exploring in this fourth layer in the AI and machine learning space with specific interest in image recognition and sensing. So those are the four layers of product and they deliver four areas of value for our customers, namely asset management, service and maintenance, sales insights and proximity based marketing. There's one further aspect which I should mention and that's our smart cities business in Australia. We are providing proximity based digital marketing services to a few Australian cities and have recently been selected by the Great Ocean Road Tourism Pro Project and the Narrabai Council as a service provider. While Smart Cities is a very small part of our offering, it is built on a platform that can be scaled to other cities globally. So we don't think there are many companies like us in New Zealand actually developing multi-mode IoT business solutions for the world's largest food and beverage brands. But we're at the very early stages of an ongoing global megatrend, and that's also presenting other opportunities in adjacent markets such as food quality and loss management and transport applications. We don't believe any other IoT provider to the food and beverage space has the scale of connected devices installed that we do, and we have more customer installs underway. So this year, in 2019, for example, we have a new 100,000 system rollout with a new IoT customer in the beer market. Our growing install base, coupled with the market growth trends that I talked about, has given us the confidence to keep investing in IoT to strengthen our current leadership position and position ourselves for medium-term growth in revenues and profits. I'm going to close with just a few comments on our outlook for 2019. We believe we are on track to our profit goals. In 2018, we were EBIT profitable with the company fully funding its DNA and capitalized R&D investment for the first time ever. We did take on further high interest debt, as Howard mentioned, with Onimeg and Meta Capital to continue to invest in new projects and help us fund some working capital, but also because we didn't want to raise further equity. And in fact, we have not raised new equity since 2015. The debt raising was a choice, and if we hadn't have made that choice over the last few years, we may have been impact positive earlier. But of course, we were also impacted by some unusual component shortages um, with costs of $500,000 in 2018. So looking at our result, with 900,000 of interest costs and a unusual $500,000 of extra component costs, and then a $400,000 net loss as a result, we think our operating performance improvement is definitely on track. So in terms of this year, 2019's numbers, our EC motor forecasts are looking lower than last year, and we will continue to come under pressure on motor margins, which we are responding to selectively. To balance that, we continue to see solid growth in IoT, with IoT expecting full-year revenue growth of around 30%. IoT is expected this year to contribute close to 41% of our total revenues, and the gross margin for the IoT business is expected to increase due to an improved product mix and due to the expanding nature of our data and software revenue. So in summary, due to the forecast weakness and competitive strategies in EC Motors, countered somewhat by IoT, the company's total revenue in 2019 is expected to be flat to slightly up when compared to last year. EBITDA, net profit, and operating cash flow are expected to be higher. Are we targeting a net profit? Yes, we always are. But we are also prepared to invest some profits on new growth programs in IoT because we feel like top-line growth with expanding margins delivers a better long-term outcome. So that uh, finishes my comments. Just a couple of admin notes before I hand it over to questions. There are a handful of slides that cover the content of today's call on the NZX website, so feel free to download those. Our next conference call will be a webcast format. And finally, Wellington will be hosting an industry day uh, in early April, on or around April the 10th, at a venue to be advised, and we'll be sending invites out, invites out for that industry day uh, very shortly. So. 
hopefully some of you can attend that. Now I'll hand it back to the operator for questions. Thank you, operator. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Please limit your questions to one question and one follow-up question. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. I will take our first question from Kevin Bennett with Harbor Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for the update, Greg. Could you just give a little bit more color on why you think motors sales would be going flat to backwards? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons, Kevin. We did, in 2018, benefit from um, an unusual situation in one of our regions where a competitor um, had some issues um, and lost uh, some business, and we won that business. Um, we think that might normalize somewhat through 2019. That was more of a one-time event, so we had some unusually high demand from that region. Um, and we also are making a conscious choice to not necessarily compete in the lower end of the motor business. I mean, we are seeing a lot of price pressure in that business and selectively will compete, um, particularly with some of our larger customer relationships. But we, you know, we may well, and we have done this in the past, decide to, to walk away um, from some of the lower end business um, just because it doesn't make sense to our uh, longer term direction and, and profit objectives. Um, I guess the third reason, if there, you know, we are seeing some early customer forecasts for the year uh, and some of those are coming in lower than last year. We think that is, is maybe the start and a little bit of a dynamic of the global kind of economic uh, stress that's out there and whether it's customers being conservative in the early part of the year or whether that's um, real, time will tell. But um, just, you know, with those three things, uh, we think the motor business is going to just maybe pull back a bit this year, I would, is, is our expectation. Right. So it's fair to say you're no longer at the um, the old conventional motors. Are they all gone now when you're doing that sort of at the base level? Uh, we're we're still selling some of them. Sorry, Sarah, carry on, Kevin. No, no, that's all. That was... Um, yeah, we're still selling some of the older... Oh, you mean the, the non-electronic motors, Kevin? The yep. kind of shape, the non... Uh, yeah, I mean, very, very low volumes. We have some legacy customers. In fact, we have one large legacy customer in Asia for the old technology motor that um, is a good customer and we can service them well. We've been thinking they would move to energy-efficient motors over time. They haven't. You know, we'll probably end up servicing that customer until they make that decision. Or So there's some legacy customers there, but we're not really marketing at all in the... Oh in the non-energy efficient motor space now. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And we'll move on to Marco Walter Daniel, who is a private investor. Please go ahead. Marco. Hi. Um, Marco. Hi. hi, guys. Is there any chance you can mention the, the brand names? Um, there's, uh, I think it would be helpful for for uh, investors to to really realise that whatever the brand names are, and you say they're internationally known, um, to give some sort of uh, idea of the scope uh, and the potential. We're actually not allowed to, Marco, um, by contract. Um, we don't talk about our customers by name. I mean, I guess, um, uh, you know, if you look at any of the large non-alcoholic and now alcoholic beverage, worldwide beverage brands out there, you, you might think that we'll have product in all of those uh, types of brands, um, but we, do, we literally can't uh, name them uh, under the agreements we have with those customers. Um, so sorry about that. Okay. Uh, and second question, uh, any progress with getting some uh, realistic finance uh, as opposed to the 16% per annum stuff? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll hand that over to Howard. Howard, you might want to answer that with the new news on the Bank of New Zealand financing. 
Well, we, we announced uh, just before Christmas that we had secured, um, a, a, I guess, a relatively modest $1.5 million um, trade finance line with BNZ. Um, that was um, that was after many years of um, of, of talking to various banks, um, and um, we're now looking to um, to expand on that. So um, certainly, the, the plan is to repay all the um, expensive debt this year. Um, it's all short term, and that is the planning. Um, and ultimately, be you know replace it with the BNZ. The BNZ line, I we borrowed some euro money the other day, and it was at three percent. So um, obviously, a lot more attractive. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And there are no further questions, but again, as a reminder, it is star one on your telephone keypad to ask a question. We'll move on to Anton Vanderwilt from FNZC. Please go ahead. Yes, hi there. I just uh, wondered if you could tell me uh, or tell us just where you expect to see gross margins heading in the medium term. Um, you sort of signaled some sort of that slight disappointment at 23.24.3%. Uh, um, but if you move away from the old motors, then presumably those <clears throat> those margins expand um, quite nicely. So where do you expect those to, to be in the medium term? I think what I'd say about that, Anton, is I, I want to get through Q1, first quarter first, which is looking stronger than last year. Uh, we said that in our last disclosure. I want to get through the first quarter and maybe just get some more confirmation from some customers on mix before I start to throw numbers out. Uh, so that'll, you know, that'll be in the next month or so after we're through Q1. Um, suffice it to say, if we did, what did we do last year? What did I say, 23 or 24%? I mean, 24, I yeah. that. If we did that kind of gross margin in 2019, we'd continue to be disappointed. Um, but, you know, I don't want to throw a number on the table until we get a bit further through the year and get some more stability in forecasts. Right. Just in terms of containment shortages that you talked about um, uh, in the last year, and obviously they're looking to continue into 2019, is that sort of a medium-term issue, or is this sort of, um, and what sort of component shortages are they? Uh, what, what's been happening in the market for the last couple of years has been a lot of shortages, significant constraints in semiconductors. It's very well written about out there in the industry with semiconductor manufacturers uh, not being able to meet uh, demands. I and mean, we've seen lead times. In the beginning of 2018, we saw lead times blow out to well over 12 months. Well, that all started to change at the end of last year. We had major semicon manufacturers who we use uh, shorten their lead times down to six to nine months uh, and tell us they had capacity and tell us they were willing to look at pricing. And that hadn't happened for two years. If you look further upstream in the industries, there's some big uh, semiconductor equipment companies who, and some big tech companies who have had their um, uh, market valuation slammed because they've all dropped their numbers for the next kind of 12 months because the demand isn't there in that semicon space anymore. So we're seeing some of those semiconductor component manufacturers free up a bit more. Uh, we are still seeing issues in smaller components like capacitors and resistors, but that has a, that's a, that trails a bit from semicon, to be honest. So we've still got some conservatism, I think, um, in our thinking this year around component shortages, but we don't think it will be anywhere near the impact it had on us in 2018. Um, if anything, we've probably got some additional components because we had to go and order these seriously long lead times um, to make sure we had parts on the shelf to meet customer demand. So hopefully it eases up a bit in the first half of this year and I'll be able to update everyone on that as we uh, head into the second half. Thanks. Thanks, Anton. And once again, it is star one on your telephone keypad. Looks like we have another follow-up question from Marco Walter Daniel. Hello, Marco. Again? Hi. Um, just, just yeah, again. Sorry. Um, no worries. Go your for data it. and software services growth the, with the um, the beer people and and others. Um, these guys have purchased and are purchasing uh, your solution. How how? How strong is that? I mean, uh, can someone come along and and, uh, and offer a better price, a better product, and uninstall you and put themselves in? Or is it uh, slightly more complicated than that? 
Yeah, it is. Well, there's there's both a commercial complication and some technical complications. So we, when we when we sell uh, an IoT solution to a customer, we sell them the connected hardware, which I talked about. Uh, but then yep. we sell them a, a data plan, um, the first layer of software. And there might be other layers of software that we will sell them over time, like our digital marketing solution or maybe an inventory management solution that we're working on. But And those are all long-term software contracts. Uh, it ranges from, yeah. you know, it might be a two-year contract, a five-year contract, or even a ten-year contract. So just commercially, we feel like we've got some um, stickiness there. But then also, from the technology point of view, what we've developed is a platform for these customers. And, and that platform touches many different parts of their business, how their uh, refrigerator is operating, so it manages uh, maintenance or uptime or sales performance on their cooling solution or indeed also a, an ambient food delivery system like a, a shelf asset in a supermarket. But it also then provides um, a way for them to connect to the consumer and deliver real-time digital promotional campaigns to the consumer. So because it touches so many aspects of their value chain and it's got all the data from this installed fleet of point of sale equipment that they're using we're building you know we've built reporting tools so they can manage their fleet more effectively it's very very integrated into their system now they could change it i mean anyone could change it but it, it's 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 part of their operating system once it's embedded so it's it's hard to do that more than once actually so we feel that that is another aspect of how sticky it is the third thing i'd say marco as well is i mentioned the apis and sdks the kind of application uh, programming interfaces we're actually developing the tools that allow our customers to take our platform and interface them to some of their large off-the-shelf enterprise systems um, which includes some of their payment solution providers so once then we start to get some connectivity and integration to other large enterprise systems companies over out there so we've just become part of their business solution which makes it very sticky uh, so I'd never say never I mean we could always it's very competitive out there and uh, but you know once you're in we think um, that you know that's why we we were working really hard to grab market share quickly and get in to these big customers first because once you're in I think it's hard to uh, hard but not impossible to displace thanks and it looks like there are no further questions, but again, as another reminder, it is star one on your telephone keypad to ask a question. We'll pause for just a few more moments. And there are no further questions in the queue. I'd like to turn the call back over to Mr. Greg Allen. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, just finally, I mean, we think we're a very interesting company right now. We have a clear plan to grow in an exciting new tech space. Uh, and we still have, certainly in our new motors, a motor business, uh, ECR2, that is, that it's growing, even though overall we may see some pullback. But a very clear plan to grow in an exciting new tech space. EBITDA is growing every year for the last four years, expanding IoT software and hardware business and amazing global customers. And our longer-term vision, as Howard mentioned, of revenue growing to north of $100 million dollars, and gross margins expanding as a result of our IoT business solutions is is well underway. So uh, that's the way we're thinking about the business. I really appreciate you all calling in and getting the update, and we look forward to updating you again through the year. And do look out for the Industry Day invite. We'll be sending it probably in the next week, and hopefully some of you can join us uh, there to learn more about our technology. Thank you.